Right. Erica, are you responsible for navigation aids for the state of West Virginia? <laughs> no, but I can tell you, I can sympathize with you, Rob. I mean, 81 is terrible. I mean, people oh, yeah. are just driving so fast on 81 at times. There's the wonders. You know, I, I come up through the Winchester area, so every day there's so much traffic from about Kernstown clear up until the um, Route 37 bypass exit. I mean, it's just slow moving because there's just so much so much traffic or an accident or what have you. Eric, is there any truth to the rumor that when you and Rob were talking before the show, you asked who was going to be on, and Rob said Maria and Bill, and yes. you said, can I schedule for another day? <laughs> Well, no, I just said it's it's weird. I, I always get this uh, stellar crew. So uh, there's been occasional times I've had John Gilstrap, but not very often. It's mostly Maria and you, Bill. So it's a pleasure. Thank you. Your softball question's coming your way, Eric. Here we go. Right, Here we go. <laughs> As a percentage of highway in the state, 81 clearly isn't much. It's 26 miles through West Virginia from Maryland into Virginia. And there are certainly much longer highways in West Virginia than I-81. But it is a disaster from a safety standpoint. Yes. I subscribe to Alert Berkeley, and my phone seems to go off all weekend long. Whenever if there's rain, snow, sunshine, it doesn't <laughs> matter. I'm getting texts about accidents on Interstate 81 that shut down traffic, block a lane, uh, what have you. And and I think if you'd ask me, like the one thing you could do to slow down traffic on 81, and I'm not talking about putting more police out there or whatever. Because they can only pick off one person at a time. Let trucks back in the left lanes. If, if The trucks have to be in the middle lane and the right lane. And if the trucks in the middle lane are going 80 miles an hour, and you're in the left and you want to pass the truck, you've got to go 90 to pass the trucks. Right. But if you put the trucks in the left lane and they're going 75, 80. Or 60. Let's be honest. You can't pass them. I know. And then you I can't know. be going 95 miles an hour up and down I-81 because if you've been in the left lane going 80 or 85 or even 90, you know that's not even fast enough because there's somebody behind you who needs to go it's faster. right on your tail. Yeah, right yeah. on your tail. Be, and then the, 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 the slow lane, the middle lane, it's uh, the thump, 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 thump. I mean, it's like... Oh, it's like it's been strafed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, it's uh, not a highway that's in good shape. So, uh, Eric, let's talk about money. Sure. Speaking of fixing highways, uh, we had a surplus in June, and that took the surplus to the year over eight hundred million dollars, as you had projected way back in, uh, I think, uh, last uh, fall, if I remember talking to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. About it. So the governor, who is on next, has called. He thinks uh, the Senate and the House in for. I believe it would be termed a special session to yeah. try to figure out a way to make the tax cut full 10 percent uh for this year the the triggers have kicked in am i correct in saying that well the july cpi numbers that's what they're reviewing but yes you know they're they're estimating a three to four percent tax cut so and the governor you heard the governor's announcement that he would like to do an additional five percent let's just try to make it an uh, you know across the board 10 percent personal income tax cut it's very doable in fact he actually um gave you part of the plan the plan would be he, he mentioned hey look if you're scared or if you're nervous take some of this money and put it in the personal income tax reserve fund and that's ex and that's exactly what we should do so you started off the show by saying we have a 826 million dollar surplus we're actually down to about uh, 589 million because we had a special session in may and the legislature spent about 236 million of it so Coming into August, if this special session, uh, we'll have about $589 million to decide what we want to do. The governor recommended that if you wanted to take some of this money, put it over into the personal income tax reserve fund to hedge or to offer more security, by all means do it. And he's right. That's the whole reason that we have this personal income tax reserve fund in order to you know, have that security blanket or that cushion in case things were to go awry. And a ten, overall 10% tax cut would cost us about $400 million. So if, if the legislature met in August and if we decided to move $250 million over into the personal income tax, we'd be sitting on $650 million. 
enough money to obviously a year or two year safety net in case the legislature would have to change course. So it's a very doable plan. I think we should go for it. Yeah. So you fully endorse the 10% again this year? I do, I do. And uh, the governor was right two years ago when we tried, and in fact, the House passed the 30% tax cut. We had the money, we have the ability. The whole reason behind the flatline budget was to eventually be able to do more and more personal income tax cuts. That was the whole reason behind the uh, the flatline budget. So here we are. You know, I know I was a little dismayed yesterday. I listened to uh, my colleague um, Pat McGee on, on, on your show yesterday. And I understand the need to be cautious. And I think the analogy that he was using was about the potholes on the road and all that stuff. And But keep in mind, every time a a consumer in West Virginia stops and fills up gas, they're paying for those potholes. I mean, they're being charged, I think, 53 cents tax per gallon for every gallon that they pump. You know, so we're filling potholes. We're doing the work. We have, you know, if they can... You filling them on 81, Eric, I can tell you that. <laughs> well, they're doing them as fast as they can. But, uh, but my point is, it's okay to be somewhat cautious, but... We're okay. I mean, as far as the surplus, I know there's been talk about the Hope Scholarship. I think Riley Moore was on your show yesterday. He was. We could see 150 to $200 million. But keep in mind, taxpayers are already paying for majority of those costs. Every time you pay your real estate taxes or your personal property taxes, that's what funds education in the state of West Virginia. So those state dollar, dollars follows the students. It's not like... So it would theoretically, we would have to take it out of the school aid formally, and now it would become part of the general revenue to pay a 150 to 200 million dollar expenditure every year. But that's okay. You just reduce the state school aid formula. You make that correction for the 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 amount of students that aren't there, and uh, that's how you continue to fund the hoop scholarship. It's you know. Anyways, Billy. Yeah, uh, Eric, I'm a little confused. Yeah. Uh, uh, his uh, for the last several years, you've you, you've invoked Kansas as an example. We do not want to emulate or follow. Also, you were a proponent, and I think a very eloquent proponent of uh, the income tax reduction was going to provide discipline to avoid. Uh, uh, to avoid a Kansas situation, but yet what has been proposed now to me is take is make an exception to the well laid out formula that you have and make an exception. Once you start making an exception, you're on a slippery slope. It's going to be much easier to do it the second time down the line. Eric, before you respond, I have another update from uh, Alert Berkeley. The 900 block of Buck Hill shut down due to a traffic accident as well. Use caution in that area. Eric, go right ahead. Yeah, so the triggers are still, and I, and I still feel the same way. We're gonna, it will prevent us from be, becoming like Kansas because it limits the amount of spending. The surplus money is one-time spending. Okay, it's uh, unless someone in a special session did a base building. You know, if we decided here in August to do another pay raise, then yes, that would be base building. That's what you got to be concerned about. But the triggers, the, the whole trigger system is designed to limit spending to about 5% per year. Um, in this case, you have surplus dollars. Let's just say for every year thereafter, we have a, I'm just going to make this up, a $500 million surplus. Every year thereafter, you should take 200 to $300 million and put it into a PIT reserve fund. And then if you get another situation where you're able to cut, the triggers have happened, and you're at 4 or 5%, and you want to add another 5%, you're hedging by having that security blanket in that PIT reserve fund. Um, but, as long as uh, you're going to see economic growth. I mean, I've talked about this, I mean, for years. Uh, I, I still say that we're, we're going to be okay, and the governor's right. Uh, that we should have done it two years ago. The 30% cushion was uh, what we should have did you know, two years ago when we passed it, but the deal was that we could only come up with was 21.25%. But um, 
So, Anyways, so I, I don't think it's going to get us at any any problems. So you're saying with the the governor's proposing putting some money in a uh, income tax reserve fund. What I read was he was just going to reduce income tax from 21.5 up to 30 percent. That's right. But he also said, "Hey, look, if you're nervous or if you're scared." Hey, take some of this surplus that we're going to be coming in in August to spend. Take some of the surplus and park it over into your personal income tax reserve fund. And that reserve fund right now is gaining about sixty million dollars a year in interest. So, you know, at four hundred million dollars, it's been there now on its second year. So, add another one hundred and twenty to that. If you inject another two hundred and fifty million into it. I mean, you're going to see a substantial amount of money in a short amount of time. You could see 800 to a billion dollars sitting in that PIT fund to hedge anything that could go awry to give you a one and a half to two year. Hey, we need to change the course of action here. I mean, that's that's uh, phenomenal. Uh, um, Maria, before you go, Eric, how much money was set aside last year for the PIT reserve fund? Was it 500 million? Million. I, I had act, originally I had asked for uh, seven hundred million. Four hundred. Okay. And, um, has has, governor, has yeah, that I, money been targeted to be spent in August when you guys get together again? No, no. And it's specifically set up. Not that it can't be spent, but it is specifically set up to hedge or to protect us in case there's an issue with revenue on on. Uh, eliminating the personal income tax. And that $400 million is gaining interest every every day? Every year, every day, every year. Is that so, managed yeah. by the treasurer? I don't think so. I think it's uh, um, it's not it's uh, not the treasurer's office. Eric, Go, well, I, hold on a second, Bill. Yeah, I jumped sure. Maria. For, Maria yeah, right no, there. I was just going to say, so Eric, what do you think, what does this mean? Here's your softball question. I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, channeling my neighbor, Bill Stubblefield, here. Oh, okay. um, oh. So yeah, cut what, to the quick. <laughs> so what, I mean, will this have an incredible impact? Is it bringing more people to West Virginia? Is it bringing more jobs? Like, uh, what does it do um, to the yeah, average that, person? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I have heard some people say, hey, it only brings you about $300 more. But you know what? It's $300 more that you or I can make a decision what we want to spend money on. Uh, but it also opens up our state to become, to put us on a path. Hey, I visited uh, Washington State. Washington State's a great big tech state. And, of course, they have no state income tax. I mean, we could be the same way like Tennessee or Washington State. It puts us on a path to, to alert risk takers to say, hey, look, I want to take a risk. I want to create a business or, or new businesses, new investments coming into the state. All that is possible uh, as you start to reduce the personal income tax rate. So um, I said it before, we have to do, you know, we have, we're have we in competition with our surrounding neighboring states. Right now, Pennsylvania, their state income tax is at 3%. They're the lowest. So uh, we still have some ways to go. But, uh, yeah, if you want to bring in new investments, new businesses, and if you want to give back the citizens their rightfully owned money because we have a surplus, it's their money. You should do it through tax relief, and, and it's just going to spur more economic growth. Before you go, Bill, just Pennsylvania also has a piggyback local tax that's they do. anywhere from one to one and a half or so percent that you pay in your local borough on top of the state income tax. So it's a little higher than just the three percent. Go ahead, Bill. Right. Yeah, Eric, I've been I've been reviewing what was stated on W uh, West Virginia Metro News uh, with uh, the governor's comments. I do not see any reference at all to a reserve fund. Everything is a direct tax cut. Well, one good thing is you. He, I mean, he left it up to, to the legislators to make that decision. Okay. But, but you'll get a chance to ask him. I think he's coming up after me. But uh, no, I, the governor made that announcement on Monday, I believe. Uh, it's very, very doable. In fact, uh, I had called Rob and said, "Hey, Rob, did you hear this announcement?" And he asked me to be on for today. But uh, I mean, the governor's right. We we should be able to do this. Uh, we have the money. We have the, the fiscal responsibility. Everything's moving along like it should be. 
we should be fine. Okay. How do you respond to Senator Eric Tarr's comment that he views this as just to hamstring the next governor? Well, Eric Tarr and the governor have been at odds with one another for the last couple of years. Um, you know, if it was up to Eric Tarr, we would have never had the 21.5% income tax cut that we had. You know, you can be overly cautious, but I've been saying this for years, and I've been preaching from the rooftop. And, and now we've proven that, hey, look, even with a modest income tax cut, you, you know, your revenue, you're still bringing in enough revenue to where you're having these surpluses, and you're still going to continue. Remember, the axiom is if you want more of something, you tax less of it, and it will generate more revenue. Uh by the way, we are speaking with House Majority Leader and Delegate Eric Householder, who has, uh, had crafted uh, previously, along with uh, many of his associates, a tax cut trigger uh, that would kick in that each year could enable an additional 1% to 10% tax cut for West Virginians. And it appears that that trigger has been activated this year. The governor has challenged the legislature to double that amount, bring that tax cut all the way up to 10%. And uh, Eric, and I know uh, Bill mentioned, and there's a pe people in our comment section that said, I'd rather my $300 went to this or that or whatever. It's never a, a bad thing to give people back their money. I mean, let's keep in mind, as they say, that you're paying taxes into the system. Is, uh, it, it's good to get money back, obviously. You need services to operate in the state. The state does have issues with foster care, child care, and some health issues as well uh, that need uh, attention. Uh, do you feel like those issues? Areas are being adequately funded as they are, uh, as, it, as it stands, Eric? They have been adequately funded. I mean, the budget that we just passed, we passed, and I hate the, this word, but a skinny budget of $4.9 billion. Um, we spent $236 billion. So now our budget that, we're, that we, the historic July one is $5.2 billion. That's funding roads, education, you know, higher ed. Uh, all the welfare services, uh, everything that you can think of, vacancies. You know, I've, yes, there's there's vacancies at, at uh, um, Department of Health and so forth for CPS workers. But we're funding those vacancies. How much more money do we need to fund before we say, hey, look, you know, it's time to give the citizens who's been pulling this rope here a tax relief, tax break, and. Um, well, you know, finally, two years ago, we were able to start it and put ourselves on a path to eventually eliminate the personal income tax. But, uh, you know, a modest five more percent uh, uh, tax cut is not going to wreck the uh, state of West Virginia's budget. Eric, you, you asked for an example. I'll give yeah. one example, and sure. that's the teachers in the eastern panhandle. Uh, Maryland starting salary is approximately twenty to $30,000 more than the starting salary in eastern panhandle. Right. How, do you, how do you address that deferential? And we're losing well, our good I, teachers. Yeah, and, and I've said this before. Until Berkeley County or Jefferson County residents decide that they want uh, to, to give their county taxing authority, at some point they may, and, and with this extra additional taxing authority, that's how you pay for teacher pay raises. I mean, we've done, at the state level, five teacher pay raises. We're never going to be in parity with Virginia or Maryland here in the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, at some point, could you? Possibly. Uh, but I know you've been a strong advocate of the of the 1% home rule. The home rule, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. Will the citizens of Berkeley County ever decide to uh, to give Berkeley County taxing authority because they value uh, teachers or or fire and EMS more? Is excuse me, is it citizens of Berkeley County that has that prerogative, or is it the legislators? Uh, it, it could be both. But uh, for instance, if the legislature decides to vote and pass uh, uh, home rule. Uh, then there would be a referendum that the voters would have to actually make that decision. You're exactly right, but yeah. the legislators have been unwilling up to this point in time to give the uh, the counties that authority. Yeah, and I don't dispute that. I'm just saying at some future yeah. point, you know, you ask me, you know, will the state, um, I, I think at the state level we've we've tried to increase and bring pay up We've tried to, uh, you know, mitigate the cost in PEIA. So we're doing everything that we can. Uh, but I think your, the original premise of your question was, you know, are we able to fund these essential services 
uh, with the budget that we're passing? And my answer is yes, and we have been. Well, and Eric, you made a very quick reference to reducing the school aid formula. Yes. So we're at a point where I think we're close to a crisis in education, certainly in Berkeley County, perhaps the whole state of West mm -hmm. Virginia. Is the answer then to, um, to reduce that piece? Um, how do you see that? Well, the school aid formula is reduced every year in a drop in enrollment. So these students, these parents, they're leaving the state of West Virginia or they're making other choices by either homeschooling or by uh, uh, using the HOOP scholarship. So those are decisions that parents want to make. So yes, th that enrollment every year decreases and we do adjust the state aid uh, formula to schools at some point, <clears throat> excuse me, at some point, could you see the, uh, you know, and I doubt that this would ever happen. I mean, I know Riley Moore just suggested, I think that you could see 30 to 40,000 more students eligible for the HOPE scholarship. Would all 30 or 40,000 students um, take advantage of that? Probably not. Could half of them? Maybe. But um, no, I mean, you're seeing declining enrollment in, in, in uh, these schools, so obviously something has to be done. Eric Al Soder, our guest here. Final minute, Eric. In regards to the surplus projected for 2025, are there any preliminary numbers on that? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. I mean, we're in our first month right now, and normally uh, at this point uh, we are drawing money out of the rainy day fund uh, to give the governor enough cash flows to, to start the year off. And that's another thing. We have over $1.2 billion in our rainy day fund, so we have about $2 billion sitting on the sidelines right now and, and this is even more reasons of why we should be able to do modest tax relief to our citizens. Final question, Eric. Can I borrow $2 billion? <clears throat> What's that? <laughs> yeah. You know well, where I can get to. You have yeah. to ask the governor that when he comes on next. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> hey, uh, final thoughts are yours, sir. You have 30 seconds to wrap it up. Well, my final thought is, like I said, we could easily do this. This is very doable. You know, I support what the governor said on Monday. He is right if. If there are any hesitations or if anybody's worried, take some of this surplus. Because keep in mind, this $589 million surplus, if you don't do something with it, it's all going to be spent. So why not park some of that money into personal income tax? Go ahead and give our citizens the tax relief that they need. If not, it's going to be the same status quo time and time again and more uh, stories and more arguments of why we should or shouldn't do it. Hey, we need to deliberate this and deliberate that. No, we've done deliberated. Everything's moving very, very well. We can easily do this. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, yep, Eric. Hey guys. Thanks. Bye. Delegate Eric Halsoder, House Majority Leader on the program. The governor follows Eric next.